What's up guys, Jason and Aiden here. What's up Aiden? Yeah, what's up? <laughs> For another episode of the uh, Sleeping Bee Podcast. Um, check this out. I know the last couple podcasts, the wind was a pain in the ass. Trust me, it is maybe even more of a pain in the ass for me than for you guys, although it is probably a pain in the ass just to hear the <sighs> like shit. Um, what I'm trying to talk, but check it out. I got me a microphone now, so I hope that doesn't just exacerbate the wind sounds and make them louder, and hopefully it helps, um, you know, me be able to talk over the wind. I thought I was doing a pretty good job yesterday, and then I went back and watched the podcast for the Bar Canyon Trail, and there was a couple times where it's just like, I was saying important shit, like when I was naming the Agave Peria variety Neo-Mexicana, um... And then the wind, I thought I was talking pretty loud, but the wind still fucked me up, okay? So, we got this microphone, um, you know, I'm hoping that it helps out a little bit with the, uh, um, with the wind, although today it's not windy. I go and I spend, you know, however much money on this microphone, and then it's not even gonna be windy today. But, you know, hopefully it helps out in the future, or, you know, hopefully even in just future podcasts I can use it, um, you know, somehow or some way, or if the podcast shit just doesn't work out, then maybe I can use it for something else. I don't fucking know. But anyways, um, quick, quick little shout out and little story time. Um, so Picacho Peak, the reason I chose to do this one today is because my buddy, um, one of my best friends in the world, uh, Lauren started her own podcast called Hiking with Effie. Um, so check it out if you don't, uh, if you have a Spotify, um, it might, it might be on anchor too. I think, um, I think those are the couple, it's a, it's an audio podcast. So it's not like this where it's like a video podcast. Me and her at some point, um, are going to merge. She's actually supposed to be my first guest. Um, you know, when I actually conduct the I call them interviews or whatever, they're not really interviews. They're just conversations, really recorded conversations, but she's a cool chick, um, works at a flower farm, uh, again, started her own podcast, but she had mentioned the very first podcast that she's done, the only podcast she's done so far, um, she mentioned Picacho Peak because there's some history. This is one of her favorite trails. Me and her have some history here too um, because we came last year for the 4th of July, hiked to the top of the peak um, at night and had a 360 degree view of the fireworks shows going on in Las Cruces from campus to Mesilla, um, to the Donianas, to like literally everywhere um, in Las Cruces. So if you listen to her podcast and you listen to her stories about this place and about this trail, and then you parallel it with the podcast that I'm about to do right now, episode five, um, you'll know a little bit about the trail, plus you'll be able to visualize some of the plants. So if you do decide to come out here, if it's if it appeals to you and you do decide to come out here to Picacho Peak, um, hopefully you will you can learn about some of the vegetation out here. So um, yeah, gearing up to go, let's go. Sleep and be. All right, here we are at our first plant. Um, this is a Laria tridentata. Like, like I said, I'm hoping that this microphone works and kind of blocks out some of the wind instead of um, making it louder. Uh, we've looked at Laria tridentata before in previous podcasts. These are the ones with the yellow flowers. I haven't shown you any of the flowers, but I've shown you the white fuzzy seeds. Um, I don't see any. Look, there's a one forming right now on this plant, but I don't really see any full mature seeds at the moment. But um, one of the reasons I'm bringing it up, even though I've mentioned it before, um, is because this plant, one of the things I didn't mention about this plant is that uh, it's rumored to, in the botanical world, it's rumored 
to uh, shoot up a bunch of these uh, chemicals from its roots that prevent other things from growing around it. So you can see some grasses, you know, a little bit of grasses and stuff growing in there. But for the most part, if you look, there's not anything growing around it. Not anything growing around that one or that one. They're all just by themselves. The one thing that I do see growing around these sometimes are different species of the Cactaceae family. And one of the things that I'm uh, wondering about that is, I wonder if there's some kind of symbiotic uh, relationship or some kind of mutualism going on where potentially the uh, creosote will shade the, uh, provide extra sh shade for the cactus and the cactus in return provides a little bit of protection um, from predation from, from the creosote. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I did, I took a medicinal herbs class uh, when I was undergrad and we did a phytochemical analysis um, where we pulled one of the medicinal components uh, called Y-Call out of this particular species uh, using GC mass spec, uh, which is gas, cr uh, gas chromatography and mass spec spectrometry. I, I never say that word correctly. There's always like one word that you can't fucking say, and that is my word, spectrometry, spectrometry, something. GC mass spec is what it's known as in the um, in the plant world, but check it out. Um, see all these creosote, and then I told you there's nothing really growing around it. Um, check it out. So... Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, but look, right here, we have a hedgehog cactus, uh, Echinocerus, so this was always Echinocerus triglochidiatus, but when I went to, um, check out the Chihuahuan Desert Nature Park in the Donianas the other day, um, it was, the, the sign had changed to Echinocerus uh, cochineus, and I'm not sure if that's a new sign, if that's an old name, or what, but this is uh, the scarlet, scarlet Hedgehog Cactus. I always call it Echinocerus triglochidiatus, um, but it might not be that anymore. It might be uh, Echinocerus um, cochineus. But check it out, it's growing in this crease. So, and then if you come over here, um, you'll see, I'm hoping, like I said, I hope the wind isn't too much pain in the ass, but here you can see Another species of the Cactaceae family, maybe, maybe you can see it, it's kind of hard, there's like a glare on the screen, there it is, um, Opuntia macrocentra, this is a purple prickly pear, not to be confused with uh, Opuntia santorita, look there's another one, um, not to be confused with Opuntia santorita, which is in the, uh, also in the Cactaceae family, but that one's the uh, Sonoran desert native, and not the Chihuahuan desert native. But that, that's the one that's going to be generally planted in the landscape, um, you know, and stuff like that, as opposed to this uh, Macrocentra, which is going to be planted out, or not planted, it's going to be growing out in the, uh, in the wilds over here in the Chihuahuan Desert. So here's one that should be uh, familiar to you if you watch the last, sorry, let me put this water down. Um, but if you, if you watch the last episode or two of the podcast, um, this one should be familiar to you. This is Roost Microphylla. This is the sumac. I, I plan to, um, this is the little leaf sumac, micro meaning little, uh, phyla, you know, pertaining to the leaves. So little leaf sumac. I plan to show you guys, I know, um, I've, I've discussed some of the, the same species over and over and over again, but repetition is key, um, to learning this shit. So if you hear me talk about all the same species over and over and over again, it's so it can kind of get instilled in your brain of what is what. Okay. And then, um, there's new things that I'll pick up that I'll learn about these particular species as time goes on. So there might be something new that I'm bringing to the table, um, you know, particularly for these, um, you know, for, for some of the same species that I go over. But um, reiterating, I'll help you in a second, okay? Um, just reiterating the fact that desert plants are going to have really, really small leaves to um, reduce transpiration rates and water loss. 
you know obviously it gets very hot in the desert today it's 95 degrees um you know but it can get over 100 degrees in the desert and so the leaves you know if you have big old leaves and big old flowers and shit it's going to not only take a lot of energy and a lot of the carbohydrates and carbon resources from the plant to produce these leaves and produce these flowers it's also going to um, use a lot of water um, just like humans how we sweat uh, through our through our pores or our glands in our body um, Plants will do the same thing, except theirs are called stomata, so they're st stomatal pores. They're little microscopic pores that'll open to release water and then close again. Um, so not all of the water gets released from the plant. And as a matter of fact, I'll talk about, uh, if I find another cactus around here, I'll talk about cam photosynthesis, um, which is uh, chrysulean acid metabolism. There's generally three types of photosynthesis, uh, photosyntheses photosynthetic processes um, or photosynthetic cycles. So there's a C3 uh, type of photosynthesis, C4, and then CAM, which CAM is really just a modified C4 photosynthesis. So things like corn, you know, will go through uh, C4 photosynthesis, um, and then the cactus will go through the CAM photosynthesis, but I'll get to that in a second. And again, um, just showing the roost microphylla, this is right next to the species that I just showed you of uh, microphylla, but this is, um, this one has fruits on it. This one has the berries on it. Um, botanically speaking, I don't think they're actually considered berries. I don't know what the proper terminology for this, it gets confusing as fuck, honestly. Um, there's so many different, there's like aggregate of follicles, there's droops, there's berries, there's plumes, there's poems, uh, or not plumes, there's, there's poems, there's all kinds of different shit, and it's all just very, very particular. Um, I mean, you don't really need to know it. I mean, I got through an entire, you know, college degree without memorizing all this shit. Um, but, you know, it's good to be knowledgeable about certain things. But these are the roost microphylla berries or fruits that are edible. Um, like I told you, they're tart. Um, I showed you, a, if you watched yesterday's podcast, there's a, video, a little clip of me eating one. Um, pretty tart. Tastes like warheads. Um, but I like them. You know, it's they're, they're so pubescent that they might not be palatable for some people, like I mentioned yesterday. But um, they're good. You can make sumac lemonade, sumac tea shit like that there's some webbing on here so you know uh, possibly some spider mite uh, infestations and stuff but um it's a it's a cool plant it's a really cool plant um roost microphylla so check this out we have um well first we have this prosopis glandulosa this is the one i've told you about honey mesquite um it has the pods that will dry out so two thorns per node um and a node is really just a point on the branch where new growth happens. Okay, so this is a node here, this is a node here, you have another node up here, another node up here. You get the idea. But this is Prosopis glandulosa. Look at that a little insect there. That's cool. But uh, Prosopis glandulosa is the one, again, where you can take these pods and uh, dry them out. Once they, this is an immature green pod, but once they turn yellow, you can dry them out. Um, and you can put them into, uh, you can grind them up um, and make them into a flower, just like you can with the opuntia seeds. Um, and I don't know, potentially a cylindro opuntia too. I mean, they used to be in the same genus, so I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do that. But don't try it and then, you know, have it not work out and then blame me because I don't really know. Uh, that's my disclaimer. But check this out. Um, there's a little sphoralcia growing in here. Um, most likely... Maybe, maybe Sphoralcia ambigua, they're very, the Sphoralcias, the globe mallows, are very, very hard to tell to a species level. It's really going to depend on the flower um, color and then, you know, the different leaf morphologies. Although I think most of the leaves look the same. Yo, but check this out. So, as a matter of fact, um, this is, like all the dead shit here, that is Accordia nana. That is Desert Holly. And they say that it's, you know, because normally these desert hollies will, um, 
will produce asexually. So they're going to just produce um, clones of themselves. And they say that it's fairly rare to see one flower, but check this shit out. Oh, I keep getting stabbed by some. Oh, that's what it is. Um, hold on. Hold on. Look at that. They say that it's rare to see a flower. And we found one that's beginning to open up its flower. That's incredible. Um, but look at this. It's just, it's everywhere. Accordia nana. Oh, well, that, that wasn't it. The last one I just showed you wasn't it. But look. Accordia nana, Accordia nana, desert holly growing in these little, um... Oh, the mosquitoes messing with me. The mosquitoes? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, did what we can. But, uh, yeah, the Accordia nana, that's pretty cool. I've never actually seen one that had, you know, the beginning stages of a flower on it. And like I said, they say that it's rare to see that happening. So it's actually pretty cool that we just stumbled upon it right now. I've been waiting forever for these to come back to life I, every time i come out they're at that stage where they're just yellow and pretty much dead um i've been waiting forever to see these pop back up um so that's really cool hidden in the little prosopis um there's another roost right there roost microphylla just covered in berries but one of the things i wanted to show you about the prosopis um so check this out Oh, this is just dead. From a distance, these look like flowers, the little yellow parts. So I was going to show you the flowers of the prosopis, but these are actually just uh, chlorotic leaves. So um, we'll move on to the next. So here I told you I was going to mention uh, if I could find another cactus. Um, I was going to mention the cam photosynthesis the Crisulian acid metabolism photosynthesis. Um, so you can look up that cycle and stuff yourself. But uh, when, it, when it pertains to carbon, the one thing I wanted to say about it, though, um, this is a Puntia macrocentra again, the uh, um, the purple leaf, or the, the purple prickly pear. And you can see, like, the new little succulent type of leaf formation on it. But the stomatal pores, um, the reason cactus like this with the cam... Uh, photosynthesis can do so good in the desert the harsh desert environments is because with cam photosynthesis um, what will happen is these stomatal pores um, will close during the day to prevent water loss and they'll open up at night or in the early morning um, you know so the water can escape without too much water escaping from the plant making it detrimental to the plant and eventually drying it up and killing it so it's it's a very unique evolutionary adaptation and then not only do they do that um, but they have these very fleshy pads where they just are able to store you know a shitload of water um, and believe it or not the uh, the spines actually do offer a little bit of shade for the plant, it doesn't seem like much, but that's why I think that these have some kind of mutualism, possibly with the creosote, because look, there's no one growing in the creosote. Look how shaded that is, though, compared to if it was just out in the open desert, you know what I mean? So, another cool, um, you know, it's got these little tunas that are forming. Um, so, whenever those are mature, then you should be able to come out here with a pair of tongs, because they got the little glockids on them. Those are a fucking pain in the ass. If you ever get like a bunch of glockids or little minute spines, um, if you ever get those in your skin or whatever, it takes forever to get them out. And it's super annoying um, and it's super painful because you'll forget that they're even in there. They'll just kind of burrow in your skin. And then if you like rub across your skin, it'll uh, it, you'll just feel like a little pain. Like it's like getting a splinter like times a thousand though. It's like it sucks. But anyways, um, whenever these mature, you should be able to come out here and harvest them, uh, use tongs, take them out. Um, they'll, they'll turn a purplish color, a uh, reddish purplish color. So uh, take them out. You can singe the glockids off just by burning, you know, burn them off. Or you can scrape them off. It's a little bit more foolproof to burn them off because then you can just make sure that all of the glockids get off. And they got such a waxy... Uh, skin that it doesn't like the the burning doesn't really affect 
the skin at all. It's not going to burn the entire fruit itself. Um, but they're pretty good. You can make margaritas. You can make lemonades. You can make all kinds of stuff. You can cut the pads off, make nopalitos. If you are going to, uh, let me turn the attention here real quick. If you are, let me just, uh, quick little, um, disclaimer. If you are going to come out and forage wild plants, make sure to follow the rules of wild crafting. One being never take from the mother plant, never take from the mother plant, because that is the source of nutrients and water for her children. So if it's something like an agave that sends up pups, never take the huge agave plant, never take it. Okay. I mean, you really shouldn't be coming out here digging up agaves anyway, um, or ocotillos or anything of that nature. Um, you know, I, totally against poaching, never poach. Um, but if you are in like stranded in the desert and you do have to take some stuff to forage, um, there are rules, specific rules, a uh, wildlife etiquette and a uh, wild crafting etiquette that you must follow. So that's one, never take from the mother plant. Number two, only take from plants that are in abundance. So for instance, the creosote is in abundance here. So if I have to take anything from the creosote, then it's fine. Um, because there's so much of it, you know what I mean? It's not like endangered or anything. The third thing, um, there's more to these rules, but these are the three main ones. The third thing is never take more than a third of one plant because you don't want to strip it of all its resources. You don't want to stress the plant out, which could eventually kill it. Um, so just be mindful. Okay. Don't be selfish. Be mindful of nature and you're not the only person in the in the fucking ecosystem okay you're not the only thing living in the ecosystem the insects will feed on the um the 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 cactus the birds will feed on the insects the the predators will feed on the birds and then we'll feed on the predators so everything is in a chain everything is connected so again don't think you're the only one don't be selfish one thing I do want to point out real quick before uh, I end this segment is the cochineal insect. Check it out. So one of the problems with the prickly pear species is they'll get this uh, cochineal insect, which when crushed um, will be used, uh, will produce like a reddish dye that can actually be used in um, like an artificial flavoring for shakes or artificial dye for like shakes and stuff like that. Um, it can be used as a dye for like t-shirts. So it's, it's detrimental to the plant. It's not good. There's an abundance of cochineal, um, on the prickly pears out here and it just, it kind of sucks, um, for the plant, but there is an upside at least for cultivation purposes. Um, humans can take the, take the insect that's a nuisance and make something of it that could potentially be profitable. Nice. Uh, so check this out. So I showed you this yesterday, but it didn't have any leaves. Um, and the Bar Canyon Trail didn't have any leaves and didn't have any flowers. Um, but this one has leaves starting to unfurl. Uh, see that? And it's got the flowers. Boom. Isn't that cool? So this is the Acacia gregii. Um, I believe it's in the lake. I... I want to say it's a leguminous plant. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure it's in the Fabaceae family. But, um, because uh, reminiscing on what the seed pods look like, uh, very, very legumey. You know, they got the stereotypical leguminous seed pods. If you, if you know, you know. You know what I mean? Sleeping bee. Sleeping bee podcast. Let's go. Where's that bee at? There's just a there's just a bee hovering. Like I said, I love seeing bees on the Sleeping Bee podcast. Shit makes it make sense. But anyway, check it out. Uh, these have these super dope little puffball flowers um, that the insects just love. It's just there's a shitload of them on on each branch, a shitload of them, and it's super cool. These have really tiny leaves as well. Again, follow falling into the. Uh, morphology of desert plants small leaves generally hairy or pubescent um, preventing water loss and things like that um, like i said uh, in yesterday's episode this one might be confused especially if there's no leaves or anything on it, it might be con confused with the prosopis glandulosa but if you look at the the size of the thorns again these are technically thorns 
modified stems. Um, if you look at the size of the thorns against the size of the thorns against the uh, of the Prosopis glandulosa, you can tell that these ones are, um, you know, significantly smaller. Look, there's more webbing right there. But uh, these are significantly smaller than the Prosopis glandulosa. So if even if there are no like super super clear cut identifying factors such as leaves or flowers, um, and there's just thorns and twigs on there, you should be able to tell, like again, even though the Prosopis glandulosa and this species, what they have in common is there's two thorns per node um, that occur at every node, but um, you should be able to tell which one is which, even if there's no leaves or flowers, based off of the size and the density um, and the diameter of each thorn. Okay, guys, so uh, the last, we're already hitting our mark, and me and Aiden got to go home so we can get ready to go uh, to go train, but um, this is our, this is going to be the last species of today's episode. This is Okotillo, um, Fokiaria splendens. You can, um, so for the first thing I want to say about this plant is it's very, very iconic to the Chihuahuan uh, to the Chihuahuan Desert, just like the saguaro is um, very iconic to the Sonoran Desert. Whenever you think uh, Sonoran Desert, you think and and plant life, you think saguaro, right? So whenever you think Chihuahuan Desert and you think plant life, you think Ocotillo. So this is um, oh. you okay? I'm trying to get up there with you. Okay. Well, just be careful because there's loose rocks. Just be careful because there's loose rocks. Yeah, a little blood. It's okay. A little blood never hurt you. I'm almost done though. You can stay down there, okay? Or you can come back up here if you want, whatever. Um. Sorry, I cut, cut the recording a little bit. Uh, a little bit early because Aiden was trying to make it up the hill and there's some loose rocks and he ate shit. And, uh,. Cut his knee open a little bit, scraped it up a little bit, but uh, good thing this is the last species. Good thing we're about to go, I guess. But anyway, um, Ocotillo. This is the Fokiaria splendens. It is the only species uh, in the Fokiaria genus that occur um, north of the Mexican border. This is, they call it a candlestick. Um, just because you don't see it right now. You can just see the buds. They're not open, but these will actually turn into these uh, gorgeous red flowers. Some of them might be open a little bit, but it's kind of hard to uh, to reach up there. But anyway, um, these will turn into these gorgeous red flowers, and so they just kind of look like candles. It looks like a lit candle on top of this stick. Um, with these, the what happens is these are technically thorns as well. Uh, botanically speaking, they're thorns. Um, the good job. The um, look at this. Look at this damage. Look at that damage. I don't know if you can see or if it's too shady, but anyway, um, it's good to bleed once in a while. You know what I mean. But uh, these plants, the um, the petiole will actually fall off. And or the petiole is what becomes the thorn, so um, th it's just another way to protect itself. These plants look dead most of the year, and it's just because they have this super dope ass um, ability, this evolutionary adaptation, this this tactic to watch out for your face right there, dude, um, to just drop their leaves whenever. Um, you know, in times of drought. And you might be wondering, like, well, if they drop their leaves, how are they photosynthesizing? Well, check this out. Um, photosynthetic bark. Boom. They have, they have photosynthetic bark, so they're able to photosynthesize um, and capture yeah. carbon in their, um, in their stems um, so they can, you know, produce all the, the, the glucose and all the sugars that they need to keep the plant alive and then whenever there's a little bit of rain they soak it up they bust out with a shitload of uh, leaves and so a lot of people they're like well you know it looks dead most of the year i don't like the ocotillos because they look dead if you look into the evolutionary adaptations and you look into the biology of why they look dead it's actually very fucking fascinating and the fact that they have this photosynthetic bark is just a really cool adaptation the fact that they can drop their leaves in times of drought is a cool 
adaptation to these desert environments um and especially because look how big they get you know what i mean they, they get pretty big so it takes a quite a bit of water um to get that big and quite a bit of energy to send that water up the xylem from uh you know the xylem to the to the leaves and then back down through the phloem um you know the two-way system called the phloem that disperses the carbohydrates and the water um from the leaves back to the roots and then roots to the leaves so it's a very fascinating species um one of my favorites you can actually the hummingbirds love it um because whenever these flowers open up they're more like tubular shaped so they actually have a really good hummingbird population that come and pollinate the flowers um you can eat these flowers the flowers are actually edible they're, they're kind of grimy i've tried them before they're kind of grimy i i like to dip them in honey and then eat them um i think they're pretty tasty that way but again if you're going to forage stuff just follow the rules of wildlife etiquette follow the uh principles of um wild crafting and then just real quick uh before we go i just wanted to show you guys uh it'll probably be the thumbnail but i wanted to show you guys this is picacho peak so the trail that we normally go on is over here. Me and Aiden decided to take a new trail today. So we're not too far from the car. You know, we only, we barely even made it a small portion of the way of the entire trail. I've never been on this particular trail before, but we wanted to check out some plants, see if there's anything kind of new, uh, you know, growing out over here on this part of the trail. But this is the mountain that we climbed, um, on the and at nighttime on the 4th of July to get a view of the entire see if you can see there's just it's desolate there's no houses or infrastructure or urbanization or any of that you know shit um so when you get to the top of this mountain you can actually have a very good view of everything from the Robledos to the Donianas to the Organs to you know NMSU's main campus and stuff like that so that's going to be it for this episode, guys. Um, plants of uh, Picacho Peak. Again, I, I gave a shout-out in the beginning. I want to give another shout-out um, to Lauren. Um, check out her podcast, guys. It's called Hiking with Effie. Um, if you enjoy storytelling, um, if you enjoy a nice little... Uh, I don't know if she's going to have this with every episode, but if you enjoy a nice little ambient uh, you know, type of... Uh, music like coffee shop music uh, that was in her first episode which was kind of cool it just gave it a nice little uh, nice little flavor you know what I mean to, to the podcast itself instead of just just talking there's a nice little ambience it, it went really well with the with her voice I, I believe personally I think it was super cool um, but check it out I don't want to say too much about it um, because that's her story to tell but it'll be you know I'm going to have her on again on as a guest and so we'll probably be talking about her podcast as well hiking with effie available on spotify so lauren if you're listening good job um we'll we'll try to tr troubleshoot some podcast shit together because me and her are both starting out at the same time so but you know end of the episode uh, for today so like and subscribe sorry as it might be kind of short we didn't have a lot of time uh we went through a couple different plant species that we've already been through but again i want to reiterate certain things so you guys Oh, hold on. Uh, so you guys actually learn the stuff instead of just me trying to show you what I know. I want you, like, the, the purpose of the podcast is to actually teach people shit. And in order to be an effective teacher, you have to reiterate concepts. And uh, in this particular case, you have to reiterate uh, plant species names and things like that. And again, um, I hope the microphone helps with the wind a little bit. Um, if not, I'm just going to have to... It's, it's part of the trial and error, guys. It's part of the um, the learning process. It's like, fuck, dude, how do I control the wind? You can't control the wind, really, you know, unless you just get access to harp if, you, if you're if you a conspiracy theorist out there and all that shit. But we don't got to talk about that today. That'll be time for another episode when we got some, some, some conspiracy theorists on as guests. I think that'll be kind of fun. Um, okay, real quick. Uh, like and subscribe um share the channel with your friends uh mention it in your own podcast if you have podcasts like lauren did I was her show. she mentioned me in her podcast yesterday um so i thought that was super cool so um 
yeah, like and subscribe, uh, click the bell, you know, get notifications, stuff like that. Let's grow the channel. Um, let's learn about some fucking plants, guys. Let's learn about some, some native vegetation, maybe some native wildlife. Um, it's not just going to be focused on the Chihuahuan Desert. I'm going to be going to the Sacramento's, up to Cloudcroft, the mountainous area, the Lincoln Desert, although the entire state's on fucking fire right now. So there's a lot of the national forests that are closed down, which is very unfortunate. But once they open back up, once shit gets under control, you know, we'll, we'll do some more exploring. There's, there's a lot of cool shit out there to find. Uh, we have native strawberry species. We have a bunch of ponderosa pines that grow really tall, um, you know, in the forests out here, or, or at least out in the Sacramento's in the Lincoln National Forest. So, um, again, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and uh, we'll turn it to Aiden and see if he's got anything to say.